you know, how do we get the best of England and move that over to the U.S. and take the best of the U.S. and bring it over to the U.K.? We looked across the pond and, and the U.S. said, well, wait a second, England spends less and they live longer. You know, how can this be? How is this possible? Well, both countries are very, very different. At one end of the spectrum, the U.S. has historically been much more private. On the other end, the NHS typically quite state-run. And any more than we can take pub culture from, say, the U.K. and shift that over to the U.S., we can't take the NHS and just parachute that into to the U.S. The question is, what can each country learn from each other? I think the U.K. needs much more patient choice. You know, historically, the NHS patients have had to be just that. They've had to be patient. They waited a long time. The system was all too frequently geared toward the convenience of the provider rather than the convenience of the patient. And I think what we're seeing in the U.S. is much more consumer-directed health care that hopefully the U.K. begins to adopt. Well, historically, the NHS was really devoid of financial incentives. You know, budgets were set the year before. Hospitals essentially did what they thought was right with very, very little attention paid to what patients wanted. The, the service was structured much more to the convenience of the provider than to the patient. And what that meant is not too many incentives for quality, not too many incentives for efficiency. People wanted to do the right thing, but essentially they were working in a structure that really didn't have the incentives that you needed for a 21st century healthcare system. The idea with patient choice is you give patients a choice of where they can go, you give them the information to choose which is the best service, and hopefully then that creates real incentives for providers to step up their game, to provide a service for patients that's accessible when they want it, that's high quality, and that's really reactive to their needs. You know, and the other issue that we talked a lot about was the potential of choice to promote equity. That traditionally in systems without choice, the people who have it tend to be the well-off, the educated, the wealthy. And it's the people who tend to be least advantaged in society who also don't have choice. So in systems without formalized choice, some people still have it. And that tends to be a source of inequality. And so what we said is, not only does this really create incentives to, to raise performance in the health service, to make a much more dynamic health system, it also probably has the potential to improve equity. And the really good news, we, we published an article in the BMJ which found just that. So that over the last decade, not only did waiting times fall significantly, but they became really much more equitable. So in 1997, the, the poorer you were, the longer you waited. You waited about two weeks more if you were in the most deprived quintile of the population. A decade later, there was almost no variation, depending on who you were. And that's a huge success. One of the things you have in the U.S. is competition between insurance companies. And what you see in the U.K. is competition between hospitals. Interestingly, I'd say the U.S. is really suffering from a lack of competition right now. So if we look at Alabama, 90% of patients are insured by one company. If we look at Iowa, 74% of patients insured by the same company. And essentially what you have is private markets, low regulation, and no competition. And so we shouldn't be shocked that we see prices go up and quality go down. And, and that's just not simply a, a viable market. One of the things that President Obama is proposing is making the insurance market vastly more competitive. You know, so bringing in this public option that really will, will compete with the insurance companies that are there already. And that's very, very different than what you have in the UK, which is really regulated competition, which is public and private hospitals competing for public patients. Every country, US, the UK, are under pressure to do more with less. And historically, what you see is in the US, they're much better at the acute high-end services, the cancer care, the stroke care. They don't do as well in the primary care. And, and the question is why? We looked across the pond and, and the U.S. said, well, wait a second, England spends less and they live longer. You know, how can this be? How, how is this possible? They have worse uh, cancer outcomes. They, they die more frequently from heart attacks, but somehow we don't live as long and we spend about twice as much. And part of the answer is really public health and it's, it's the health of the underlying population. And the lesson is unless we get people healthier before they get to the hospital, we really aren't going to fundamentally change how much we spend on health care. I think that raises the, the issue of well, how do you do that? You know, is it the government's responsibility? Is it the insurance company's responsibility? Is it our own responsibility for our, for our health? And I think for me, the answer is it's probably a, a bit of all three, that it's, it's the government creating an environment that allows a market with really fundamentally sound incentives to operate. It's insurance companies that make more money by providing better care rather than denying it. And it's still keeping in incentives for individuals to, to lead healthier lives so that they're rewarded for, for really fundamentally 
improving their own health status. Um, but I think it, it raises a tricky question, you know, a, a delicate balance between autonomy and what's in the public good. And I think that's going to be one of the issues in the next 10, 20, 30 years. You know, to what extent are we willing to you know, fundamentally limit people's choices, people's autonomy, what they can and can't do for the sake of public health?